this week on In the Studio, I'm going to talk about stitching around curves. Every machine is going to take larger or smaller stitches when you begin going around a curve, depending on if you're on the outside of a curve or the inside of a curve. I've run into a few people who say they have a machine that will eliminate this problem, but so far I haven't found that machine. I'd love to, but I don't think it exists. However, there are some techniques you can use that will eliminate the problem. I've marked a design onto a sample piece of leather, and as you can see, it's got some curves on it. This is a pattern for eight rows of stitching, so as I continue to add rows, those curves are going to become tinier and tinier. This is why it's absolutely essential to learn to navigate around curves. One of the first things I want to talk about is how not to navigate around curves. So I've got a curve here, and what I cannot do is get going and miss the curve, and oh wait, now I've got to steer back onto it, and miss the curve and steer back onto it. If you'll notice what I have here is several corners, and I'd like to remind you that curves don't have corners. It's always a good idea to try to avoid having corners in your curves. Sometimes people will stitch a curve just as I did a minute ago, and they will think that the solution to not having corners in their curves is to never stop. So then what happens is they can't keep up. It runs away with them, and they've got a curve, but it doesn't match the curve that they wanted. The solution is not never stopping when you're on a curve. The solution is stopping often. So what I'm going to do here to make a perfect curve is I'm going to stitch two or three stitches. You always want to stop and pivot when the needle has gone all the way down and just started to come up. If you pivot before that, then you're going to have a problem with either skipping stitches or making knots. And that's what we're doing is we're pivoting on the needle. So I've made two stitches. Now I'm just going to make a tiny little adjustment. Another stitch, tiny adjustment, another stitch, tiny adjustment. Depending on how small your curve is, that will influence how often you have to adjust. And any time I get into a curve and can't continue to make the turn, then I pivot. I pivot before I get past the curve. That way I can continue to have one long, smooth curve. So you pivot when the needle has gone all the way down and just begins to come up. So all the way down, just begins to come up. Now I'm ready to pivot. On the last episode of It's a Boot Life, I talked about a pair of boots I was making with the United States seal on them. At the time, I hadn't gotten approval from the customer. He wanted to see the back panels of the boots stitched before he approved the entire design. That's not usually the way I work, but we've worked together before and I trusted him and I was confident that I could make him happy. Well, mostly confident. There were a few things on this boot top that I'd never done before, but I had a feeling it was going to turn out okay. The back of the United States seal is somewhat plain, but it does feature a giant eyeball surrounded by rays of light. I had never inlaid an eyeball before. In spite of my inexperience with giant eyeballs, I think the finished project turned out great. In the middle is the poster board design where I've drawn every element of the design onto the poster board and then stitched it with no thread in the needle. On the right is a boot top that hasn't been stitched yet because I am lazy and busy and he only had to see one so I only stitched one. And on the left is the finished boot top that I sent to him. Along the bottom of the design, you can see one of my least favorite things to do, and that's lettering. Novus Ordo Seclorum is a Latin phrase that means new order of the ages. 
And if Morgan were here, she could tell me whether or not I'm pronouncing that correctly because she's minoring in Latin in college. Stitching letters like this isn't particularly difficult. It's just time consuming and I live in fear that I will misspell something. Working with leather is a one shot deal. You get one try and if you mess it up, you have to start over. There are no do overs. And now we'll zoom in on my favorite part, the eye. I'm so proud of that eye. I'm going to read a list of the top 10 things I wish every client knew. Number one, each pair of boots is like my child, my own little creation. I love them and I hope you do too. Number two, yes, I occasionally make a pair of boots that doesn't fit properly or needs an adjustment to the fit. If it does need an adjustment, please be kind. I'm disappointed too. It's an inconvenience for both of us, but it happens sometimes and I'll work with you until they fit. It's in my best interest to have you walking around in a pair of boots that make you happy. Number three, I cannot donate a pair of boots to an auction no matter how worthy the cause because I have no way of knowing who the buyer will be. There are people out there with needs or fitting issues that I can't accommodate and I need to know this before I take the order. Number four, if there's a problem with how the boots fit or look, call me and send them back to me. Don't send them to another boot maker or a repair shop and then call me and complain about the way they fit or look. Number five, it takes me around a month to build a pair of boots and my average waiting time is usually around a year. If you call me two weeks before your wedding wanting cowboy boots for yourself and all six of your groomsmen, I can't help you. Number six, one of the most important things about bespoke boots and shoes is that they're made to fit your feet. Most boot or shoemakers require a personal meeting with each client to measure their feet. It's not enough to send an email saying you wear a size 11 and you have large calves. Number seven, no, I can't and I won't copy a pair of boots that you saw on someone else's website. Number eight, it takes me a month to build a pair of boots. My waiting time is about a year and each boot represents a significant portion of my monthly income. I cannot afford to donate to celebrities and public figures who are much wealthier than I am. Number nine, all of the decorative work is done while the boot tops are flat, before the boots are put together. It's not possible to change the flower color, add another row of stitching, or remove the initials of your previous girlfriend after the boots are finished. And yes, I have been asked that. Number 10, some clients treat me with respect and make it clear that they understand they're not only supporting me, they're helping to preserve an historic craft. These are the clients that make me the happiest. If thinking pleasant thoughts and finding joy in the work make a difference, then those are the clients who get boots with very good karma.